Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Would you open your Bibles to Acts chapter 19? We're going to begin in verse 8 today. We have a few themes in our scripture. One, once again, we see the example of the supremacy of God over evil powers. We'll see in our story today that, once again, when it comes to God versus evil, God wins every time. God seems to have a unique way of bringing people back to him or saving people. We're going to see a really cool moment where he uses something that I'm sure even the Apostle Paul may not have expected to turn people back to God. We also see in their story today that believers are delving into wicked things and they have to come clean. They do want to come clean. They come clean before the Lord and before all those present and make themselves right before God. We also see uh, the topic of healing in here as well. So there's a lot of great things to take away. Let's, Let's just ask God to help us apply whatever we need to apply to our life from our scripture. Amen. And I want to just encourage us to approach today's message with humility. None of us in this room have arrived spiritually. And this is important because at the end of the message, we're going to take time to sing again, to to consecrate our lives, to, to set ourselves apart from this world and make sure we're giving our whole life to God. So we're going to take time to pray over that, to worship God. And so just I'm, I'm preparing you for that too that we're going to spend some time here together to make sure that when we leave, we've committed our whole life to God. Amen? Especially when you see what's happening in this story. And the title of the message is When Believers Come Clean. And so there are times where we just, we, we as believers need to keep ourselves humble before the Lord and come clean on things too. Amen? Let's start with verse 8. And actually, let me, let me show you a map uh, before we do. So here's the map we've been using. I, I realize it's kind of small. Uh, so let me help show you where it's at. But Asia is where Paul is. This is Asia back then. And Ephesus is where right there to the uh, middle left there. I'm seeing the bottom left, sorry. So Asia's in the middle in the pink. And Paul's going to be in Ephesus. And Luke is highlighting what's happening in Ephesus. If you ever read the book of Ephesians, This is to the church he was writing to in Ephesus. Uh, So you'll see some themes come. Actually, we'll see spiritual warfare in our story today. It makes sense why Ephesians 6 says, put on the full armor of God. Because of what Paul dealt with there. And we also learned today that he was there for about two to three years, not just two years. So let's, let's, let's read. Then Paul went to the synagogue and preached boldly for the next three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some became stubborn, rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way, meaning those who follow Christ. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him. Then he held daily discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrannius, And this went on for the next two years so that people throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. Let's take a moment here just to admire that Paul did not let this resistance stop him. Instead, he found another place to preach the Bible that was open to those who could do lectures in this community. And he seizes that moment and for two years, he pounds the pavement with the gospel. He does not let anything stop him and he keeps going. Let's see what else happens around the context of this experience. Verse 11 says, God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. These were unique. When handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled. Wow. Wow. A group of Jews was traveling from town to town, casting out evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation, saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, 
to come out. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. Yeah, that, that, command you in the name of Jesus, you know, that, and that guy, that, that, the one that Paul preaches about. A little shaky there on the confidence. Seven sons of Siva, a leading priest, were doing this. <clears throat> they believed that this priest may have defected from honoring God, and his sons went wayward. And it says here, but one time when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? And just so you know, it, that's never good for a demon to talk back to you instead of leave. So this isn't going to go well for them. Then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they, had, they fled from the house naked and battered. Wow. And I know it's funny, because it is, but at the same time, it's serious, isn't it? Now, just so you know, this hall was open from 11 to 4, historically. This is what we find from historians outside of biblical texts. So we wouldn't read this information in the Bible, but if you study outside of biblical sources, this hall was open from about 11 to four. And so what Paul would do is, and he had to work still sometimes, if the money ran out from the church, he would have to work on tents. And historians say that this is possible that as he worked on tents, he took his sweat cloths and put them on the table. He would take his apron off and put on the table and people didn't wanna wait for him to come to the lecture hall. So they came and grabbed those things to go heal their friends and family. I believe that's possible. This is an unusual, unique miracle. I don't think that this should be the mode of operation today all the time. I would be weary if someone starts selling um, handkerchiefs on TV for $29.99. That's, again, that's wrong. Freely we give, freely we receive. We don't heal for money. Okay? And so... It is possible that that took place. You know, he was sweating. He would put the cloth down. He would take his apron off. He would go to the lecture hall. But there are times where they did not want to wait for him to preach, teach, or to pray over their family members so they would grab them and bring them into close contact. This reminds me of Jesus, though, the bleeding woman who did everything she could to find healing and no doctors could help. So when she saw Jesus, she just knew that if I just touched the hem of his garment, I would be healed. And Jesus said, I could feel healing power leave me. Who touched me? Maybe today you need a touch from heaven. The train of his robe fills the temple. The train of his robe reaches all the way here through the power of the Holy Spirit. We can touch his hem today for healing. We also know that Peter was a powerful man of God. God used him to do great things and we also read that even his shadow was known to cast healing on people. So I wouldn't think that this is out of the ordinary for God. God can do anything, amen? Now, these unusual miracles and the work that Paul has done for years has gotten the attention of some Jews. And this was an area where they believed in powers. They practiced witchcraft. They practiced other things. And so they were trying to go around and cast out demons by invoking the name of Jesus, but there was a problem and the demon found out and knew it, they didn't have a relationship with Jesus. They invoked upon the name by reputation, not by personal relationship. The demon sees right through that and calls them out on it. I don't even know who you are. Notice though, he knows, the demon knows who Paul is because he's been paving the, or pounding the pavement for years with the gospel of Jesus Christ and casting out demons. And for sure, this demon's afraid of Jesus and Paul at this point. But these people, they don't phase this demon. We also see in the scripture that demons have the ability to work against a human's will. Because I do not see or think that a man, and I don't see in scripture, I wouldn't think that a man wants to beat up seven people that day. So the demon inhabiting its host has persuaded this man to beat these men terribly for what they've done. 
And all this is taking place under God's watch. He's going to use this for his good. And it's going to wake people up. So let's read about that. Verse 17, the story of what happened spread quickly all through Ephesus to Jews and Greeks alike. A solemn fear descended on the city, a reverence for the name of Jesus. And the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. Many who became believers confessed their sinful practices. Be ready for this. A number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them at a public bonfire. The value of the books was several million dollars. It is believed that unbelievers and believers came forth with their stuff. They came clean. And so the message about the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. I love that verse. When you get some things out of your way, the word of God works. The word of God works right here in this moment too. The word of God is more powerful than any demonic power. Amen. Amen. You see, the word of God was going to cleanse this city no matter what they did. But it was the word of God that made them and inspired them and got them to repent of those things and get rid of them in their house. In other words, they didn't go, well, I might need this later. No, it went further than that. It wasn't just a temporary confession. It was genuine repentance. They went home They got all their wicked things and they burned them in a bonfire. Millions of dollars worth of content and books. They said, we're done with this. We're not playing games anymore. We're not gonna have one foot in the world and one foot in God. I'm coming clean today. I see that the name of Jesus should be revered and worshiped. And because of this cleansing, there was a great movement of the word of God. Do you want to see a move in your life? Do you want to see a move in your home? Do we want to see a move in this community? Do we want to see a move in our nation and around the world? I know I do. It's going to take repentance and getting back to the word. Revival begins with the house of God. Amen. We can't get around it, believers. We can't sit here today and want everything to change, but we're not willing to submit to God and to be changed and transformed by him. Surrender today and humble yourself and acknowledge. They had to publicly humiliate themselves. They had to publicly bring these things out of hiding and say, it was me that's been practicing sorcery. There comes a time where we have to publicly come out with it before the Lord at least, at least genuinely. And sometimes we confess to a brother or sister in Christ and we say, I got to cleanse some things out of me. I'm bringing it forward and would you pray for me? That takes courage, by the way, and I applaud your courage. We can't play games because the devil wants you to hide these things because he loves hiding in the dark with you. Captives are set free when they come into the light, not when they stay in the darkness. You're not meant to walk in the darkness. We just sang about it. Back to life and to the kingdom of light. Praise God. And afterward, this is what our scripture says, afterward, Paul felt compelled by the spirit to go over to Macedonia and Achaia before going to Jerusalem. And after that, he said, I must go on to Rome. He sent his two assistants, Timothy and Erastus, ahead to Macedonia while he stayed a while longer in the province of Asia and especially especially in, in Ephesus. So this is why we believe he was there for even longer than two years. And so what Luke does now is he tells us what happens when the word of God takes supremacy over evil things. And so I just want you to be aware, and I know this is from the Lord right now, because this is not in my notes, but you're going to dedicate yourself to the Lord and you will be spiritually attacked. Expect it, it's coming. As soon as you get yourself right with the Lord, the devil swoops in to discourage you. 
Just bet on it, although we don't bet. It's coming. It's coming. Put on the full armor of God. Paul would say to the church of Ephesus, put on the full armor of God. Ephesians chapter six, study it, read it. Every day pray, every day read the word. Claim those things because it's Jesus Christ you're putting on and he already lives in you, but he wants to work through you. No power is greater than the one who lives in you and the one who covers you. That's the beautiful thing about God. He doesn't just live in you, he covers you with his armor. Praise the Lord. Well, let's see this spiritual warfare we're talking about here. Verse 23, about that time, serious trouble developed in Ephesus concerning the way. It began with Demetrius, a silversmith who had a large business manufacturing silver shrines of the Greek goddess Artemis. He kept many craftsmen busy. He called them together along with others employed in similar trades and addressed them as follows. Gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this business, but as you have seen and heard, this man, Paul, has persuaded many people that handmade gods aren't really gods at all. Oh, is he right? And he's done this not only here in Ephesus, but throughout the entire province. Wow, that's how effective the gospel ministry is. Of course, I'm not just talking about the loss of public respect for our business, really he's saying the loss of money. I'm also concerned that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will lose its influence and that Artemis, this magnificent goddess worshiped throughout the province of Asia and all around the world, will be robbed of her great prestige. Ooh, so you can see here the battle of gods. You have, the, you have Elohim, the one true God, going against these false gods. And they're disturbed, not just losing money, but they're disturbed that attention is going to be taken away from their god or goddess they worship. A fertility goddess by the name of Artemis. It's interesting, the Ephesians have... They've named it Artemis, but also the Romans or the Greeks named it Diana. There's arguments whether it's the same goddess or not. Some believe it's two different goddesses. Some believe they've been influenced by one or the other. Some believe it's the same. Luke doesn't get into that. He's referring to the Ephesus church. They're worshiping some goddess named Artemis, and it's causing a disruption. And now we have this big meeting against Paul with all these people who make shrines and little idols for their house. And verse 28 says, at this, at this their anger boiled and they began shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So now they're worshiping their false god publicly out loud. Soon the whole city was filled with confusion. Everyone rushed to the amphitheater, dragging along Gaius and, okay, I had a hard time pronouncing this earlier, Aristarchus. Yes, I did it. We'll go with that who were Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. So now we've read four traveling companions in this chapter. That shows you that Paul has spent a lot of time here making disciples. So cool. Verse 30, Paul wanted to go in too, but the believers wouldn't let him. It was getting a little tense in there. Some of the officials of the province. So now officials, public officials are reaching out to Paul, sending a letter, don't come in begging him not to risk his life by entering the amphitheater. Inside, the people were all shouting, some one thing, some another. Everything was in confusion. That's how you know it's not of God. In fact, most of them didn't even know why they were there. That's typical of mobs. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander, one of their leaders, forward and told him to explain the situation. He motioned for silence and tried to speak, but when the crowd realized he was a Jew, because not everyone was Jew here. There was Greeks and Gentiles. They started shouting again and kept it up for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Now, if I was there, I'd be like, look, I'm out. You guys, one minute was enough. This is long, two hours. Of course, I'm a believer, so I wouldn't do that at all. That's a long time. I want you to see this. You know, when we read the Bible, we read so fast, we don't think about this. This is what the church was against. Tell me if you've seen a church spend two hours just worshiping the name of Jesus. 
saying holy, holy, holy is the king of kings for two hours. But imagine if we stood here for two hours and did that. They stood there for two hours and worshiped their false god. That's what we're up against. In fact, our world, we live in our world, those who don't know God yet, and I pray they do come to find him through Jesus Christ, they worship their idols all day. What we're seeing in our land is false worship. What we're seeing in our schools, in our communities, in our state, even in our homes, we can see false worship all day. Let's not be blinded to that. Two hours. That's what Paul and them were up against. At last, the mayor was able to quiet them down enough to speak. Citizens of Ephesus, he said, everyone knows that Ephesus is the official guardian of the temple of the great Artemis, whose image fell down to us from heaven. We don't have any evidence for that. But he goes on to say this, since this is an undeniable fact, you should stay calm and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, but they have stolen nothing from the temple and have not spoken against our goddess. Apparently at this, this entire time, while Paul preaches the gospel, he doesn't insult ever. He just preaches the gospel. There's no evidence of him ever insulting. Now, prophets can get bold. Read Isaiah, read Jeremiah, they will do that. But in this case, Paul never did anything. He just preached about Jesus and worshiping Jesus. And that changed the hearts of mankind. Isn't that beautiful? And this is what he says. This is what the mayor says. If Demetrius and the craftsmen have a case against them, the courts are in session and the officials can hear the case at once. Let them make formal charges. And if there are complaints about other matters, they can be settled in a legal assembly. I'm afraid we are in danger of being charged with rioting by the Roman government since there is no cause for all this commotion. And if Rome demands an explanation, we won't know what to say. Then he dismissed them and they dispersed. I believe that's God's protection over the church. Using that man. And then this chapter concludes in the next chapter, verse one. When the uproar was over, Paul sent for the believers and encouraged them. Then he said goodbye and left for Macedonia. And next week we'll see some of his goodbyes in chapter 20. Wow, powerful story, isn't it? And that mayor stepped in and said, look, if you have just calls, bring it forward. But right now this is a matter of public opinion. And that's not gonna hold up in court. I'm moved by this story in many ways the reality of spiritual warfare, the need for us to be pure and holy before the Lord, the respect of the name of Jesus Christ. So today I just wanna give you a couple of takeaways and then we're gonna spend time in the presence of the Lord just making sure we come clean and be right before the Lord and call upon the name of Jesus Christ, amen? The first point I wanna encourage us to apply from this is consecrate your whole life to the Lord. Doesn't God deserve your whole life? The believers here and those who were new believers still may have had one foot in the light, the kingdom of God, and one foot in the kingdom of darkness, the world, the evil. And godliness and wickedness don't mix, but they enjoyed their mixers. Uh, yeah. The misuse of Jesus' name got their attention. They realized this demon exposed something that those men did not have a true relationship with Jesus Christ. The severity of that event woke them up. It reminds me of 9-11. 2001, I believe, right? It was a tragedy. And this week, we actually remember that. There was a great solemn over our nation because of the evil that was done to innocent lives. It woke up a lot of people. I asked my dad to confirm this. He said churches were packed that weekend. It woke people up. They realized, whoa, what could be coming? Now, we even heard people say this could be the end of the world, you know. And then it wasn't long after, and it was a terrible thing to happen. 
And some people did stay and come to the Lord through that. But many people just quit coming to church and never made a decision for the Lord. A little different from our story here. They publicly, publicly humbled themselves and repented and didn't turn back. And we know that because it says the word of God moved powerfully from that point forward. There is a reverence for God that needs to be reignited or made alive again. A remembering of how holy and perfect God is. He is pure, unstained by anything. He never sinned. Jesus never sinned. He's a holy God. And yet, he's a merciful God willing to come and be with us through Jesus Christ and show us grace and patience and love. That mercy from a holy God makes me and should make us want to clean up our lives out of gratitude for him. Amen. The word consecrate means something set apart, like sanctified. Or even the word saint is used to be someone who's holy. And God has called us to be set apart from the world, to be consecrated. And even things can be consecrated in your life, like the Bible. I remember my dad teaching me, never put anything on top of the Bible. Never cover the Bible with anything. And so I knew that if my dad is saying, don't cover anything with the Bible, I shouldn't let it get dusty either. I should use it. He didn't realize he said that to me because I don't want dust to cover my Bible. I don't want dust to cover your Bible. If we put the word to work, the word will work in us. Amen. Amen. They lived a double life. They were lukewarm. They were part-time Christians, holding them back from truly experiencing the power and the peace and the presence of God. And when this event happened in this story, they realized how off they were and they came clean before the Lord. <clears throat> Today, we too may have things in our life that we need to come clean about, amen? Listen, you know, the, the demon in a man that's pretty obvious, isn't it? Obviously, that man was dealing with a demon. I actually feel more mercy and compassion for people who are dealing with that. They don't, they don't scare me. I'm actually concerned for them, for their deliverance, because Jesus came to set the captives free. And I just want to say a side note, just a housekeeping thing. There could be a time, as I preach the name of Jesus, that a demon manifests itself in this place. As a church, we stop immediately and we pray for that person. And here's the thing, as a pastor, I must discern if that's genuinely an evil spirit or whether it's human spirit or the flesh acting out, whatever it may be. But we can pray right away because we want that person set free. And I say all that to say this, people wrestle with public demons, but we as Christians can have our private demons that no one knows about. And we ourselves can be missing out on the fullness of God's favor and presence because God will hold back his favor. God will hold back his presence until you hurt enough to confess what's wrong. That's why in James it says those who humble themselves will be lifted up. It's not those who remain prideful about it and hide it will be lifted up. It's those who confess and humble these things. He will help you. Church, let me tell you something. This is so important. If we need the Holy Spirit to save us, we need the Holy Spirit to help us live holy. After salvation, we need the word of God. We need the Holy Spirit. And we do slip up as believers. And that won't change. You will still struggle with things, but you also overcome to new levels and go from glory to glory and things that you used to struggle with no longer are an issue in your life. Unfortunately, new stuff comes up. Yeah. <clears throat> Unfortunately, new stuff come, can come up if we allow it to. 
but we can be set free and redeemed. I just want to encourage you today to not be so spiritual that you can't search your heart and go, God, I need to come clean about some things. And lastly, we're reminded from the scripture to revere the name of Jesus Christ, not just our lives because we're holy and to take care of things in our lives, but to revere the name of Jesus Christ, to keep it holy. This is why I believe we shouldn't use the name of God in vain. They used his name in vain and I'm not saying you're going to get a beat down, but they got a beat down, okay? It was bad. They misused the name of Jesus. Because we don't play around with using the name of Jesus. Only believers should call upon the name of Jesus for the work that needs to be done. But Jesus, the Bible says this in Romans 10, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So even unbelievers can call upon the name of Jesus and be saved. And only someone who believes in Jesus would do that. Unfortunately, they got exposed in this story. I wanna encourage you today, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, call upon him today for salvation. If you are struggling to be set free from bondage, from secret sin, or from anything that may have happened to you, he has come to set you free because the spirit of the Lord is freedom. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And who the son sets free is free indeed. And I just pray today, I just, I just been praying not just for conviction, but for faith. Faith that when we call upon the name of the Lord with a relationship with him, he hears us, he is acting, he's working on our behalf. He is moving in our lives. Listen, he is working when you don't even see him working. You're not, you're not calling out his name in vain, right? You're calling out him to work. Let him work the way he works. <clears throat> but today, if, if you've needed healing, if you've needed you know, anything in your life to be, to be touched by God, to be changed, you, you wanna intercede for someone else, let it be done today. Amen? His name is power. And it's not some formula we invoke. It's because we have a relationship with him and we know he cares about us. We know he cares about our family and our neighbor. He, Jesus cares about our nation. He cares about everything. Amen? If you're able, why don't you stand with me as we begin to just examine our own hearts. What we're gonna do is I just, I just wanna encourage you to examine your heart, to let God show you. You know, just so you know, when, when, he, when God exposes things or brings things to the surface, he doesn't do it to make you feel bad. He does it to help you be set free. And so I just wanna encourage you to let God examine your heart. One of the prayers I pray every Sunday is give us humble examination. Grace for regeneration. Courage for confession. It takes courage to confess things, to admit them. We're never gonna change if we can't first admit we need to change. And then do the next step, the next right step with the Lord. And maybe some of you in this room have been feeling hopeless. You feel like God's not there. He's not answering your prayers. I just encourage you to be that persistent widow in scripture and come before the judge, come before the great father and once again call upon the name of Jesus to move and, and to work. Lord, we come to you today with humble hearts. Lord, we, we can't change this world if we're living just like it. Lord, would you cleanse us from the inside out? Help us to come clean. We have this time, Lord, to to come before you, Lord, to make things right. So Lord, as we apologize, as we confess, thank you, God, that you are forgiving God and that you lift us up. And Lord, for us who, have, who are still calling upon your name for intervention, for healing, for change, Lord, we come to you with great faith today, knowing you're our Lord and Savior, you're our friend, and you care. So God, move in this place as we worship you, as we seek you. In Jesus' name, amen.